I teach uh, classes related to gender and environmental history, particularly environmental history of the Gulf South, uh, in a course called American Disasters. Uh, when I teach the American Disasters course, uh, I often start out with a simple question, an activity for them to consider. I have them imagine that the apocalypse is happening right now, uh, that the bombs are going off, aliens are invading, whatever you want to think of. And then I asked them to think about whether they would stop when it was happening uh, at this particular moment, uh, and whether they would actually take a selfie with the apocalypse. <laughs> now, how many of you would take a selfie with the apocalypse? It's going on. How many of you say that this is a ridiculous question and no, you should run for your life? <laughs> All right, I want you to remember that. <laughs> so this question emerged in 2013 uh, when the Oxford English Dictionary declared selfie to be the word of the year. Uh, and it immediately blew up online, this discussion over whether we would take selfies with the apocalypse. The older generation bashed the younger generation for basically wanting to take selfies with the apocalypse. Uh, they even proclaimed that they would be so interested in taking selfies with the apocalypse that they would do everything to risk their own life. Uh, so much so that Disney World, the national parks, all banned selfies um, in their parks to kind of preserve these, this younger generation so obsessed with the selfie. Um, almost immediately, this bashing turned kind of negative on Twitter and on blogs. Uh, and led to a larger debate over why this younger generation would take selfies with the apocalypse or not. Uh, and the younger generation immediately responded, of course we would take selfies with the apocalypse, but it's not for the reasons that you would think. We would take selfies with the apocalypse to show the world that we are experiencing the same thing, to tell them that in our demise we are together to send messages of love, of hope, and of fear. Uh, and to express that our sustainability was coming to an end, uh, and to do this in um, a group setting. Now, from a historical perspective, this debate over the selfie with the apocalypse is really interesting because we've been taking selfies with our crises or our apocalypses forever. Uh, just looking through American history, you can find multiple examples of taking selfies with the apocalypse. Uh, and hopefully, it's here we go. Uh, the Chicago Fire, for instance, after the Great World's Fair, uh, the migrant mother, this image of the Great Depression, even uh, the Deepwater Horizon uh, oil spill and this 87-day camera on the gushing oil within the Gulf are all examples of historical selfies. Uh, and selfies, by and large, allow us to track these disasters over time. Uh, to see what sort of reaction we're having, how we define the disaster, uh, and how we're measuring it in terms of our overall progression and understanding of sustainability over time. Um, and this is what my research really does look at. It's tracking these differences between definitions of fast and slow disasters, uh, between how we uh, define fast disasters as happening quickly and respond to them uh, almost instantaneously, how we define slow disasters as kind of taking uh, some time over uh, long periods of time, uh, often not having a very clear beginning, middle, and end, thus complicating our understanding of the disaster as it's unfolding. Just to give you an example, the Titanic versus the Great Depression, two very different types of disasters, uh, but both really do shape our understanding of uh, sustainability and response to disaster at large. And this perception of disaster as we perceive it and to describe it really does start to make a difference when we talk about funding and response to these particular types of disasters. Fast disasters get a lot of attention. Um, almost instantaneously, there's an outpouring of grief and support. There's financial support that's given uh, and emotional support. Meanwhile, with slow disasters, it often takes a much longer time to prove that these things are happening. And that's where historians can really intervene to try and help um, provide this longer context at large. Uh, historians can show us that these concepts of sustainability over time, for instance, are not necessarily new. These are really old words. Uh, they're just used in different ways, they're defined in different ways based on different periods, and our interest in these concepts of sustainability change uh, over time. 
Uh, they also can uh, help us to understand uh, how our reactions have um, kind of been delayed uh, or how they need to be adapted uh, to try and respond to changing circumstances uh, within our modern world, uh, thus shaping our perception of the, the modern natural disaster. My research at large looks at this concept of disaster, how we define it, how we rationalize it over time. Um, my book project looks at the hurricane naming process uh, and how it influences our perception of storms. I've worked on grant projects here at UL related to the Grand 16 theater shooting and this concept of a modern disaster, a smaller event, a fast disaster. Uh, and I'm currently working on a project um, with others in the audience uh, related to this idea of resilience and adaptation uh, in terms of coastal erosion and this slow disaster and perceptions of vulnerability overall. Um, between all of these projects, my overall mission as a historian is to try and provide this context to the very valuable scientific work that is being done here at UL, uh, to give you this kind of long durée of experience that allows you to ground the work that's being done right now uh, and be able to um, contextualize it fully. And my last message to leave you with today is that if the apocalypse happens, I hope that you will take a selfie because I'll use it in the future. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.